Why should startups consider working with a virtual CISO? As a startup, you're typically constrained in a few ways. You have a big credibility problem with your prospects. You need to show very quickly that you're a company to be trusted. You need to very quickly address their concerns that you're a serious company doing serious security. You also tend to have very strong time pressures. If you're a startup, you need to close deals. You need to move quickly. Your time as a founder or as a small team is really valuable. What you need early stage is to have your security handled correctly and quickly and have it handled in a way that's not taking up dozens or hundreds of hours of your time as a founder as you're learning. So it really comes back to meeting the needs of your clients as quickly as possible so you can close deals. Most of the clients who work with agency, it's driven by revenue. It's driven by unlocking revenue from their clients. It's crazy to me that founders are out here trying to save two bucks by writing policies and documents for their SOC 2s and ISO 27001s instead of going out there and building product, making sales, and instead they want to keep a shoestring budget and don't have their eye on actually serving customers. I, I, I totally agree. And you get founders who are kind of weighing the cost of a virtual CISO versus their own salary, not versus the opportunity cost and the, the equity they're building by building product. When you're thinking as a founder, you need to value your time based on the thing you're building. The reason you've started a company is because you're hoping to build a product worth billions of dollars, not because you're making or spending $100 an hour on your own salaries. Really, the mindset shift here has to be that a virtual CISO is going to unlock the revenue that helps your company grow and more quickly. And that, that's the mindset that I think a lot of founders miss when they're trying to DIY it. So it's fully an ROI decision. That's how we think about it. That's where we can most help. And I certainly tell my clients, if something isn't going to help bring them to a deal, do it later, right? A lot of cybersecurity at an early stage is driven by what's going to bring you revenue most quickly. Is your perspective on this that if it's not worth doing it, it's not worth DIYing and doing like a quick BS SOC 2? Like why even do that? Why virtue signal that you're kind of got this stamp? That's right. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that even when you have a SOC 2, you're going to get asked security questions by your clients. And so what a SOC 2 will say is you're going to define your policies. Your auditor will confirm you adhere to your own policies. So I could sit down and I could say that it is our policy to leave all of our ports open and run no antivirus. And I'll get a SOC 2 because the auditor will confirm I'm correctly doing what's in my policy. The problem, though, is that when I then send this SOC 2 to a client who sends me a security questionnaire... They're going to ask me what antivirus I'm using, and I'm going to say, truthfully, I'm using none, just like my SOC 2 says, and then they're not going to work with me. What we often see is that sometimes you don't need a SOC 2, sometimes you don't need compliance, sometimes you're selling to people who don't care, at which point, just don't worry about security. And sometimes you're selling to people who really do care, at which point you need more than just the box check of kind of the minimum level of SOC 2. And a lot of times I talk to people who've put this off, who didn't think they'd have a problem, and then you're on the eve of a deal closing you have a SOC 2 that really is meaningless because you don't have any real security behind it. And then you're in an emergency situation where you need a lot more in place to close a deal that you thought was ready to go.